All right, today we're going to talk here about observational studies. There's a couple important things I want to talk about real quick before we begin. Remember, data collection is an important step in the data analysis process. When we set out to collect information, it is important to keep in mind the questions we hope to answer on the basis of the resulting data. Sometimes we are interested in answering questions about characteristics of an existing population or in comparing two or more well-defined populations. To accomplish this, a sample is selected from each population under consideration and the sample information is used to gain insight into characteristics of the population. For example, an ecologist might be interested in estimating the average shell thickness of bald eagle eggs. A social scientist studying a rural community may want to determine whether gender and attitude towards abortion are related. A city council member in a college town may want to ascertain whether student residents of the city differ from non-residents with respect, with respect to their support for ver various community projects. These are examples of studies that are observational in nature. We want to observe characteristics of members of an existing population or of several populations and then use the resulting information to draw conclusions. In an observational study, it is important to obtain a sample that is representative of the corresponding population. To be reasonably certain of this, the researcher must carefully consider the, that, the way in which the sample is selected. So remember, the idea of any study is to be able to do one or both of the following two things. One, generalize the conclusions from a group characteristics to a population. So basically, generalize what we learn from a sample to the population. And we also would love to be able to draw a cause and effect relationship. Sometimes we can accomplish both of these goals. Sometimes we can only accomplish one of them. And if the sample is really, really poor, we can't accomplish either of them. Sorry, that message keeps popping up. <laughs> Observational study if... If the investigator observed characteristics of a subset of the members of one or more existing populations, the goal of an observational study is usually to draw conclusions about the corresponding population or about differences between two or more populations. So again, all the things I've just kind of explained to you. The idea is that we pick a sample from a population, we hope that that sample accurately represents the population, and then we simply observe that sample and to see what happens. In an observational study, we simply observe the sample and record what we find. There is no manipulation of the subjects. The investigator does not tell them anything nor make them do anything. So in an observation, you can maybe ask a question to get your answer. Like, hey, I want to observe. I want to find out what percentage of people wear seatbelts. I'm just going to ask, hey, do you wear seatbelt? Yes or no? Or I'm going to actually sit and watch people get into their cars and observe whether they put their seatbelt on or not. But I'm not going to manipulate those subjects. I'm not going to change anything about the subjects that are chosen in any way. There are two types of observational studies, retrospective and prospective. Um, the difference is very simple, actually. In a retrospective, we look at past records. Look at past records. So maybe if I want to um, find out some voting trends for a particular town, I will go back and look at past votes in that particular town. I'll look at the history of that town or something, maybe. Um, maybe if I were interested in... Um, looking at um, how much, I don't know, of a particular, how much somebody drinks or something. I'll look at their past, right? Or if I'm interested in somebody's behavior, I think I have a couple kids that are behavior kids. I'm going to go back and look at their past records and determine what behaviors have um, they been uh, you know, exhibiting in the past. It's all about looking in the past. Prospective is you're going to look into the future. So you're going to start now. So you're going to start observing now. and look ahead, okay? So um, very, very subtle differences. Um, basically, in a retrospective study, you're going to look at past records to examine something about a sample. Prospective, you're going to create that sample and then start observing them now. But remember, you're just simply observing, okay? Because in an observational study we simply observe, there is no cause and effect relationship can ever be determined from an observational study. Just because we observe someone drink orange juice and that we notice that they have less frequent headaches doesn't mean orange juice cause headaches. 
Um, so we can observe things, and we might observe something in a sample, and we might be able to say, oh, that's interesting, we observed that in this sample, and I observed, oh, wow, that person drank a lot of orange juice, and wow, that person has less headaches. That's all fine and dandy, but if I didn't manipulate them in some way, there's no way that I can say that drinking orange juice caused them to have less headaches. I might notice a relationship, but I cannot know that it's going to be a cause and effect relationship. However, if the sample is selected randomly from the population of interest in an observational study, we can generalize the characteristics from the sample to the population, but no cause and effect. Generalize just means that we can notice a relationship, but we can't say that it caused it. So I might notice a lot of people that have headaches, and I might watch and observe that they start drinking orange juice, and I might find out that um, as I observe them drinking orange juice, they happen to have less headaches. Now, all I'm doing is sitting and observing, so I have no right to say that orange juice caused their headaches to decrease. But if I selected the people that I'm observing completely at random from the population that I'm interested in, then I could say, well, there seems to be a connection. I could maybe generalize something about orange juice may have a potential influence on headaches reduction, but I cannot say or I cannot advertise that orange juice will definitely cause headaches to decrease. But again, in order for me to do this generalizing, I have to select those subjects at random. Okay, and I don't want to just uh, end this video. It's a pretty short video, like I said, but I want to end this with looking at two problems real quick. So, um, an article entitled, sorry, I spelled entitled wrong. An article entitled "Guard Your Kids Against Allergies" described a study that led researchers to conclude babies raised with two or more pets were about half as likely to have allergies by the time they turned six years old. First off, is is this an observational study or is this an experiment? Now you might be wondering what's the difference. In an observational study we simply observe. In an experiment we actually manipulate. We tell people what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. We manipulate them. We give them something. We don't just watch. So which is this? Well the way this question is worded, it says babies raised with two or more pets. It sounds like we simply observe people or observe families or observe children that were raised in households with two or more pets. We didn't make Make them have pets. We didn't give them pets to have around their house. We just observed. So this does appear to be an observational study. And one of the key questions we're going to ask here is that's going to really kind of lead us to some good discussion later on is describe a potential confounding variable that illustrates why it's unreasonable to conclude that being raised with two or more animals will cause you to have a lower allergy rate. So what are some things, so if you might want to kind of think out loud right now in your head, or how do you think out loud in your head, but just think out loud, whatever, um, or think in your head, what are some different things that could cause somebody to have less allergies besides having pets in the house? One thing off the top of my head I could think of is simply genetics. Some people have less allergies simply because their parents have less allergies or it's just in their family. Their family doesn't really have a lot of allergies or vice versa. Maybe somebody has a lot of allergies because their family does. Okay, So it can be something as simple as that. It had nothing to do with pets are in the house. It was because of genetics. Um, so think if you could think of some others. We might discuss some things in class that you could think of as well. Um, another one could be... Um, the type of carpet, you know, if, sadly enough, some people believe that if you have a lot of carpet in your house, the carpet holds in allergens, and then those, the, because you have around those allergens a lot, then you could get allergies, obviously. Whereas if you have like hardwood floor or stone floor or some type of hard floor in your house that you can clean those allergens off of, you won't determine, you won't get allergies. So maybe that's another reason, a confounding variable. A confounding variable is simply another reason why the allergies may have been reduced besides what we were looking at, which was the pets. So this is a good example of an observational study, and we certainly cannot conclude that having pets in the house is going to cause you to have less allergies. Here's a second problem we're going to look at, and the last one we're going to look at. It says, based on a survey conducted on a website, Investigators found that women who regularly watch Oprah were only one-seventh as likely to crave fattening foods as those who watch other daytime talk shows. Interesting. Well, is it reasonable to conclude that watching Oprah causes a decrease in cravings for fattening foods? Absolutely not. It does sound like all we did was we did a survey conducted on a website, and maybe that maybe that was a survey where people were chosen randomly, and hopefully those people were chosen randomly because that 
would obviously be a great idea. But all the survey might say was, what shows do you watch during the daytime? And what kind of foods do you crave? And if that's all we were doing was asking people questions or even observing people, maybe we selected these people at random, but then we observed what shows they watch and we observed what they eat. Because all we're doing is observing, we cannot claim any kind of cause and effect relationship. Okay. Now, is it reasonable to generalize the results of this survey to all women in the United States? Well, this is specifically talking about women who watch daytime talk shows. So what about women who work in the afternoons and can't watch daytime talk shows? Well, obviously we cannot draw or conclude any kind of these results to those women. Okay? However, if this was really randomly selected women, we could generalize these results to all women who watch daytime talk shows. As long as our population was women who watch daytime talk shows, and we selected randomly the surveyed people from that population. As long as that was done, then maybe we could generalize, maybe we can notice some kind of a connection, or maybe there's something about Oprah, or watching Oprah, or watching her show that makes you less likely to crave fattening foods. But obviously we cannot claim a cause and effect relationship, Okay, but because we did choose them randomly from the population of people that watch daytime talk shows, women who watch daytime talk shows, we might actually be able to generalize the results, but that's really about it. Okay, so hopefully that was a quick video that allowed you to have a real basic understanding of observational studies. We simply observe people to try to gain knowledge and characteristics about the population. No cause and effect relationship whatsoever and we got to be very careful if we do want to generalize to the population we could only generalize to the population of which the sample was taken from all right sounds good hopefully that was a quick video and we'll talk more later